Uh, next up, we have Mark Mager on stop and step away from the data, rapid anomaly detection, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, via ransom note file classification. We'd like to thank our sponsors Endgame, Silence, Tinder, and Sophos. And reminder, if you could, please sit down in the seats. We don't want to have a fire code violation. With that, enjoy the talk. All right, morning, everybody. So just getting things uh, a little bit about me. I'm not a data scientist, so take whatever I say up here on stage with a very big grain of salt, and please feel to uh, ridicule and embarrass me after the talk about the things that I get wrong. Uh, but anyways, a little bit about me. I'm a senior malware researcher at Endgame, uh, typically do reverse engineering and sensor development. And uh, past two and a half years, pretty much since I've been at Endgame, I've uh, been doing ransomware protection research. Uh, just to get into the agenda, uh, I'm going to provide a brief overview of ransomware, um, what your current detection methodology looks like, um, ransom notes, and then I'm going to delve into uh, some exploratory research about the uh, detection uh, research that I did, um, and then discuss uh, in depth the uh, proof concept framework that I come up, came up with, and then wrap things up in conclusion. Hopefully I have a little bit of time for questions. So if you don't know uh, about ransomware, uh, basically it's a software that's written to um, deny users access to data on their host. Uh, the most typical approach is through in, uh, encrypting individual files on a file system, and the file extensions are what's going to be targeted. Um, so think of high-value documents like PDFs, text files, or document Excel spreadsheets, uh, things of that nature. Um, and so there's two typical types of output from ransomware, uh, the encryption, encrypted files that I was just alluding to, uh, and the actual ransom notes. So detection methodology can be broken down pretty simply into two areas right now. Um, you have static detections, which are either going to be signature-based, uh, signature or heuristics-based, or machine learning-based. Um, the main benefit to uh, this approach is that all data is preserved uh, if a detection is successful, uh, but the drawback is that you essentially have one chance to detect uh, whether a binary is uh, ransomware or, or you know, malware or not, and if we miss that, then all data is going to be compromised on the host. And uh, for dynamic detections, uh, basically the way those work is it's a uh, process that's going to be running in the background. Um, that's going to monitor for any sort of anomalous behavior uh, on the host. Um, there can be a focus on detecting uh, encrypted files. Um, in certain cases, uh, some approaches leverage canary files, which are uh, files that are written to disk uh, in, you know, kind of spread out in, in different locations, and if they're modified in, in particular ways, then that can be a, a trigger for an alert. So the main benefit for dynamic detections is that you know, hypothetically, as a process is executing, there will always be an ongoing chance uh, that will be detected. So it's not just there's one initial chance to detect and then, uh, you know, you're hosed after that, um, but, you know, so should still be able to detect it later on. The drawback to uh, dynamic approaches is that essentially you're sacrificing a large amount of files in order to determine whether or not there's ransomware executing on the host. Um, maybe in, in certain cases it's, it's easier to detect uh, the anomalous behavior, uh, and in some cases it might you know, either be impossible or take a very long time. So how can we improve what the current state of the art is right now? Um, probably the best approach is to combine uh, the benefits of static and dynamic detections. In the ideal case, yes, you would detect everything with machine learning immediately. Nothing would ever execute on the host. Um, but that's not always the case. Um, you know, there's definitely false negatives. Um, so you need a robust uh, dynamic detection to serve as a fallback. So leveraging a layered security approach is uh, probably you know, the most recommended uh, way to you know, make sure you're covered for ransomware. Um, optimizing your machine learning models uh, to specifically classify ransomware as opposed to uh, just malware specifically, uh, that could prove very beneficial for this problem. 
and then to go back to uh, dynamic detections, um, perhaps there might be a way to uh, boost the time, uh, or I mean reduce the amount of time that's required for uh, detecting on this behavior. So getting into ransom notes, um, a little bit of background on this. Uh, since I've been doing ran ransomware research for about two years or so, I've executed and detonated, you know, probably almost thousands of files manually um, in a virtualized environment and kind of studied how uh, the output typically looks. And then, you know, as sort of a uh, aside, I was seeing, you know, ransom notes being written to disk in multiple ways, multiple directories, uh, multiple formats. So what kind of got the gears turning for research that I'm presenting today is that uh, I started kind of seeing a pattern in how the ransom notes looked, and so I wanted to explore that to see if there was a way uh, that we could kind of classify those and, and see if there was something there that kind of unites all of them and makes them easy to detect uh, you know, using AI. Uh, so just to go back a little bit, ransom notes, uh, there's files that are written to solicit a ransom payment. Um, they come across in multiple file types. The most typical format is uh, TXT files, plain text files, um, but you also see ones that are in more formatted uh, text formats, such as uh, HTML, RTF, um, and there's also images uh, or even like GUI-based uh, like little .NET programs. Uh, ransom notes are going to be one of the first files that are written to disk, uh, and sometimes they're even written to every directory. Essentially. Uh, the adversary is trying to be as noisy as possible in the hopes that they frustrate the users enough and get the point across that you know, their data has been you know, totally compromised and they have to provide the ransom to getting their data back. So we'll go back through here and like look at a few ransom notes to kind of get a general idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, so this one's from CryptoLocker and they kind of lead off with uh, just saying your files are encrypted. And then they talk about um, you, know, you don't have access to the description key, so you can't recover your files. Um, they want you to email them. And they're providing a specific time window for how long um, the, the ransom will be valid, essentially. Um, and then they even get into talking about the AES encryption that they're hypothetically using. Um, going on to the next sample, it pretty much starts out with the exact same way. Uh, all your files have been encrypted. And then they say something similar about all your documents are encrypted. Can't recover. Please pay us uh, 0.01 Bitcoin you know, to a specific wall, uh, wallet ID. Uh, and then they also provide email address. And finally, uh, here's an actual uh, image-based ransom note. And if you'll pay particular attention, they were requesting 100 Bitcoin, which is approximately $750,000 right now. So not exactly sure how successful they were with this ransomware campaign, but uh, they were at least pretty pricey. So as we saw from even just looking at three very disparate samples of ransom notes, you can kind of see a template kind of form. They typically lead off with saying something about your files have been encrypted. Um, sometimes they provide a family name, and then they'll uh, sometimes get into talking about the actual um, encryption that was implemented as part of uh, the ransomware. Um, they get a point across that, uh, that files can't be recovered without a decryptor that they'll provide only if, a, um, only if the ransom is provided. And then, you know, potentially provide email address and then a time window for uh, when their uh, ransom essentially will be invalid. So, uh, you know, as I previously you know, said in my intro, I'm not a data scientist, so exploratory research for me in this case was just developing a better familiarity with data science, uh, data science concepts and uh, different tools I'd use. Um, and then you know, moving on from there, uh, I need to collect ran uh, a you know, big enough corpus of ransom notes um, in order to do uh, some training. And on the flip side of that, we need to put together a nice uh, base representative benign data set um, you know, to go with the ransom notes. And you know, the, the overarching goal of the exploratory research is to determine if uh, you know, this approach can possibly work for classification. 
so uh, tools I'm using here, uh, pretty much just use Anaconda for everything, which you know, came bundled with Python 3, uh, Jupyter Notebook, and you know, also use uh, Scikit-Learn as basic. So delving into the data sets a little bit, uh, benign data, I just ended up using the 20 news groups uh, data set, which probably most of you are familiar. Uh, that's a list of the actual 20 news groups uh, that are part of that. Uh, and then for the ransom notes, uh, it's, it's definitely a little tougher to uh, put together a large collection of ransom notes. Um, not every uh, ransomware family writes them out uh, to disk. So going through and kind of manually doing the research and figuring out which families actually drop notes uh, can be a little tedious. So a, a lot of this involved manually detonating ransomware samples over a period of years, uh, collecting the ransom notes, uh, you know, storing them off, and then, you know, kind of digging them out for this project. Uh, but also, uh, you know, searching through blog posts, uh, Twitter, and, and a lot of things like that, you know, I was able to collect enough uh, samples to uh, feel confident I had something that was representative uh, of ransom notes in general. So the actual approach uh, that I was taking for the exploratory research is uh, we're just going to go with unlabeled data. Uh, we're going to take the 20 news groups data set and then uh, we'll combine that with the ransom notes. And so we will take a clustering approach using k-means and uh, set it to 21 clusters. And the way we write for that is we're using 20 news groups data set and ransom notes. And we're going to hope that uh, with the 21 clusters, the way they kind of uh, uh, settle down this, uh, you know, that they'll be distinctly, uh, each of the news groups will be in their own cluster and the ransom notes will stick together in their own cluster. Um, in order to analyze the data a little closely, we'll uh, take a look at the data using uh, an account vectorizer and a TFID vectorizer. So uh, getting started, just to do uh, some very basic uh, data prep, uh, before tokenization, we're just going to strip out new line characters, uh, convert to lowercase, uh, strip out null bytes, uh, just things like that to just get the data starting to uh, uh, make a little bit more sense. And then when we do the actual tokenization, uh, we're going to uh, limit it to alphanumeric characters uh, only. We're going to strip out any uh, stop words that are in the default uh, spaces stop words list, and we'll do limitization. So in a, a very quick example here, encryption would actually uh, turn to encrypt. So uh, here's just a you know, very quick overview of how uh, the tokenization worked. And uh, for this uh, example, I actually took you know, a very small blurb for a ransom note and passed it in. And you can see how it actually breaks down uh, two, two very, uh, you know, very core set of words there, file encrypts and Bitcoin and some payment. I mean, that pretty much is uh, very descriptive of exactly what they're going for. Um, so now, not sure how well you can see up there, uh, breaking down the most common features that were seen in the uh, 173 ransom notes, we see a lot of uh, the same sort of words. We see Things describing, uh, you know, files with what data is being encrypted, uh, Bitcoin course, encrypt, decrypt, uh, you know, things along that sort of nature. Um, like even just looking through those words, you might be able to, you know, construct what the purpose of uh, a ransom note is without having any sort of context. Uh, and then when we break it out to uh, bigrams, things make a little more sense uh, because you're working with phrasing. So uh, it's not just files in a vacuum, it's files being encrypted, files being decrypted, you're working with private keys, Bitcoin addresses, things along that nature. But just to give you a little bit of an idea of what the data looks like. Uh, then when we apply uh, TFIDVF, um, you know, looks pretty similar to what we're getting from the count vectorizer. Um, so yeah, just gives you another view of what the data looks like. Now, um, not sure how well you can see this here, but essentially with the, with the 21 clusters, they, they broke out um, like quite nicely for us, actually. And in cluster three, despite the ransom notes only consisting of 173 unique samples um, versus the 11,000 uh, messages that were in the 20 news groups data set, uh, the ransom notes all clustered together extremely well. 
um, the that, that cluster, uh, the I believe that's the top ten features that are uh, that are in that cluster, matches extremely well with what we've just seen in the previous two slides, um, and, and that actually is a a good um, test for for the data set because if you'll see the top uh, entry for the uh, for the news group in, in the in the image to the right is Psy.crypt, which is the um, uh, the encryption uh, news group at the time. Um, but yeah, if you see cluster six, it might be a little tough to tell, but it kind of, you can get an idea of how old the data is because they're talking about clipper chips, which, you know, were pop, like that was around the mid nineties or so. But, uh, but either way, um, distinguishing between uh, news group discussions around encryption versus uh, ransom notes that, that do discuss encryption at, at a more high level um, that's an, a good initial test of uh, how strong the data uh, correlates. And so delving into how, uh, you know, how the cluster actually worked, uh, we want to like kind of get under the hood and, and pass in some sample data. So I you know, took another uh, ransom note and uh, pass it into the k-means predictor. And if we break out uh, the results for that uh, using the square root of the sum of the squares, uh, we can calculate the distance uh, you know, from the centroid, uh, from the centroid for uh, you know, each of the clusters uh, here. So, in our case, with that ransom note, it did end up in cluster three, which is uh, what we're hoping, and uh, you know, so that worked out very well for us. Uh, for a second example, we kind of use something that's more generically just talking about encryption, but not specifically a ransom note. Um, in this case, it actually ended up uh, being a closer match to uh, cluster four, which is actually uh, entries from uh, computer.graphics. So um, what did we learn from doing our exploratory research? Well, as I mentioned before, we have a small set of data, but the ransom notes do cluster together very well. Um, the second sample uh, demonstrated that, that there is nuance in how the data was clustered together. Um, and you know, from all that, we learned that it appears that the data is going to be appropriate for classification. So, you know, we can actually go forward with an actual proof of concept. So, for a POC framework, we have a few requirements. Uh, first and foremost, we need to obtain the file change events in real time. Uh, we need to uh, take the file paths that are uh, being created and pass them to a model that we develop. Um, from there, we're going to read in the actual text data uh, from the file paths that we created. Uh, we're going to read in the file contents and then pass that along to uh, for a classifier to determine whether or not uh, the data consists of a ransom note. And then, if it is a ransom note, we need a way to mitigate the process. So, to reduce the problem space for this, um, we're going to put up a few restrictions here. We're going to stick to English only and uh, .txt files only. Uh, as I mentioned, they're the most common ransom notes, um, but that doesn't cover you know, the entire world of ransom notes. Um, but yeah, formatted text, it's gonna require parsing and images, we'd have to use OCR to extract the data and it's probably, you know, it, it would require a little bit of cleaning up beyond that. So at least for, the, for this research, I figured that was uh, out of scope for what I was trying to accomplish. And then uh, we're going to stick to files that are only uh, less than 20 kilobytes. And the reasoning for this is ransom notes are generally pretty small. Um, you know, kind of going back to the template I was discussing earlier, um, th they're not really trying to get across too much. They're, they're very utilitarian, just saying, hey, file's encrypted, please send us a ransom. That's basically it. So um, reducing the problem space there, keeping it less than 20 kilobytes, uh, you know, helps out with performance as well. So we can break down the, uh, the framework into a, a couple of uh, components and just two pretty distinct processes. So we'll have a file change event listener and uh, that's going to read in the events and place them into a queue for a second process which will do the text extraction and the actual classification of the notes. And then um, if we determine that there's a ransom note, uh, there will be a process mitigation handler uh, that will, uh, that will operate. So here's uh, kind of a high level diagram of 
how a typical sort of infection scenario would play out with the framework on, on disk. Uh, so you'd have ransomware executing, they drop a ransom note to the root of the C drive. The event listener is going to be, uh, you know, pulling for events at that time. Uh, it'll see a file creation event for the ransom note. And then uh, it'll pass along that file path to the text extractor and classifier, um, which will read in the contents of the ransom note, and then uh, do the actual, actual classification, hopefully return a yes, and then that will result, result in the ransomware process being suspended. Um, so for the POC framework, we wanted to build out a more representative data set. Uh, so for the benign side, we'll still stick with the uh, 20 news groups, but we'll take a smaller slice of it instead of the overarching 11,000. Um, and then to supplement that, we'll uh, leverage some of the Windows text files that I was kind of able to scoop up. So we're typically talking about log files, readme files, uh, any sort of like installer logs, you know, things along those lines. And then for the ransom notes, I uh, did my best to collect as many uh, many more ransom notes uh, as I could. Uh, ended up finding a bunch on Pastebin and a few other sources, uh, so that was a great source. Um, you know, but but still, we're left with only 350 ransom notes compared to 11,000 uh, benign uh, messages. So, uh, for the classification approach here, we want to uh, address a data set imbalance, which is very, um, you know, quite large. Uh, so we can use uh, Smote to generate uh, synthetic data for us and, and see, you know, hopefully that can kind of bridge a gap for us and make up for that, uh, uh, you know, pretty big imbalance. So the approach for the classifier here, uh, we're going to use uh, do feature selection via TFIDF. And essentially what we have is a, uh, you know, supervised learning problem. We're going to label the data this time uh, as either benign or ransom note. Uh, and then, then, yeah, we're, we're breaking down uh, all of this into a binary classification problem. Is, does the text consist of a ransom note or is it benign data? And uh, for us, a naive based classifier uh, is simple and straightforward, and that's the approach that we, uh, you know, went, went for immediately, and uh, yeah, we'll delve into the, uh, the results that we ended up getting. So, very high overview, high level overview of uh, data processing pipeline here. Uh, we start with our uh, label data set, and we pass that along to the pre-tokenization where we're stripping out characters, converting to lowercase things along those lines. Uh, we do the actual tokenization, and then we, uh, you know, get into uh, sanitizing the data a little bit by stripping out uh, stop words, anything that's not alphanumeric, and then do lemonization, as I mentioned before. We pass that along uh, to the TFIDF vectorizer uh, to vectorize the data. Uh, we'll use Smote to uh, balance out the data sets, and then we'll do the actual training with our naive base classifier. Uh, so for testing here, we're splitting the uh, the data into a 80-20 split. 80% of the data will be used for training, while 20% will be uh, used for testing. We use a train test split uh, from Scikit-Learn to uh, to handle that. And just to get into a uh, brief overview of the terminology involved, it, you know, it's probably extremely common, uh, you know, and, and known to most of you guys, but uh, the accuracy score that I'm going to be referring to here is the actual accuracy classification score. Uh, F1 score is going to be a average of the precision and recall. Um, confusion matrix, uh, just a great way to represent um, True, uh, true and false positive and negative rates. And uh, for our cross-validation, we're going to use a uh, Monte Carlo approach, um, essentially where we're running multiple runs, uh, you know, through uh, through building and uh, let's see, you know, training and test data sets uh, each time. So, so we're in in this case, we're just um, uh, we're testing out the model's ability to create. Um, you know, we're testing to see how this how this approach is, is going to be flexible and not try to uh, you know, overfit to the data that we were passing. So for our single uh, one single test here, we actually ended up doing extremely well. Uh, accuracy over 99 percent, F1 score uh, 91, and you can see from the confusion matrix uh, zero false negatives, which is great. Um, a few false positives, but 
uh, nothing too crazy. Um, so, you know, that's encouraging, but how does that scale? Um, so we need to do some cross-validation to determine if that was just an outlier um, or if it's a, you know, uh, predictor of things to come. And uh, so we ran through cross-validation, 10 separate runs, uh, varied the training and test data, and ad ended up with actually very similar results. Uh, accuracy was over 99, and F1 score was over 90. Um, the confusion matrix looked about the same, so I think that, you know, uh, vindicates, you know, the, uh, the approach to the problem that we're taking. Uh, just some graph data here to provide you a better representation of what we're looking at. Uh, as I said, not a data scientist, but things look good. So breaking uh, things out into the other uh, components uh, of the framework, with the event listener, we do need to monitor file change events. We're looking at all processes that are active on a host, and we need a way to map each event to a specific process. Uh, and focus specifically on file creates uh, in our case. Um, there's a few approaches that you can take to, uh, to getting this data, um, including uh, you know, using Python Watcher, but as I said before, the most important thing that we need here is we need, a, we, we need the type of uh, file event, we need the, t the type of, uh, sorry, the, uh, the process uh, that's responsible for the particular event and we need the file path. So Python Watcher in this case, it's based off of the uh, read directory changes API that I believe, uh, Windows API that I believe, uh, doesn't actually return any sort of source process data. So in our case, that's, uh, that's not gonna help. So uh, alternative approaches to that, you could uh, comb through event logs or uh, you can write your own file mini filter driver. Um, you know, both of those, you know, would work, uh, de developing your own driver, that's gonna take way too much work that uh, you really want to do for this project. So uh, for our case here, what I ended up wanting to do was leverage something that's going to be pre-built and see if I can kind of sift through event log data for that um, to get our uh, file events in, in real time. And so uh, for my case, I was able to leverage uh, Sysmon. Uh, if you're not familiar with Sysmon, it's uh, you know just a tool that's uh, you know used for monitoring uh, event data on on Windows, and so there's a, a specific file create event actually, uh, event ID 11, that's uh, perfect for our purposes. So we don't have to worry about distinguishing between different types of uh, file change events. We only have one type of event uh, for us here. It's uh, just create. A uh, very simple configuration file that I came up with, and then I posted uh, to the Git repository for this uh, project. Uh, we're limiting things just to uh, .txt files, uh, as I previously mentioned, uh, and just trying to uh, sift out other data, so we're not trying to uh, crowd the uh, event logs. There's a registry key that you have to add in order to uh, uh, properly allow uh, the event log to be queried at, at, in real time, um, so that's there. And so basically what we're trying to do in this case is we're going to pull the, uh, the event log, and we're going to use uh, the WMI query language, and we're essentially just going to be pulling every 10 milliseconds in order to try to get updates uh, of new file change events that are coming in in, in near real time. Uh, so we need to limit the size of, of the result set that we're getting, and we're parsing any results we get and we're stuffing them into the classifier work field uh, for extraction and classifying. Uh, that's what the query essentially looks like. Um, Pretty self-explanatory there. And for the actual uh, approach for process mitigation, very straightforward here. All we need to do to determine is uh, is that process currently active with that uh, ID and process name. If it is active, we'll suspend it, and we need to alert the user that there was this activity on, on their host, and uh, give them a choice to, uh, to uh, terminate the process or resume the process. All right, so we're gonna try a live demo here, so let's see what happens. Okay, so I have the framework here running in a single Python file. Uh, I have process monitors set up with a couple of filters. 
we're looking at Volcano.exe. Volcano is a common ransomware family. Um, and I renamed the executable to Volcano.exe to make this more simple. And we're going to use, uh, we're just going to look strictly at uh, write file events for a process with that name. So as you can see, no events at the moment. Uh, and here is my Volcano.exe. And I will execute that. And we get our pop-up. So it provides us with a specific file path uh, to the uh, text file that it determined to be a ransom note. And it went ahead and suspended uh, Volcano.exe with that specific PID. And if we go back to here uh, in Process Explorer, we can verify that that process has been suspended. And if we go through here, we can kind of look through how uh, you know, the progression of the ransomware uh, as it's writing files to disk. Uh, looks like at 540.22, that was the first activity. And uh, let's see, around 540.25 is when it was, uh, when the process suspended and there was no uh, further offense. So detection time within uh, three seconds or so, but we have to, like, for our purposes, actually, since we're not keying off of any other, um, files, what we're only keying off of is uh, the text files. So we can go through the process monitor and sift through the data to only look at text files to get a better idea of how long it took for us to uh, detect the ransomware. So we want a path that actually ends with .txt files. And so here, what we can see is that there are multiple ransom notes that are written to disk, because as I mentioned before, um, ransomware is typically pretty noisy with how they're distributing ransom notes on disk. So in, in this case, we actually have 22 of the same file that are uh, that's going to be written out. Um, oh well. Actually, I think we're only looking for t.txt, so that, that might even be less, and I think some of those were actual files that are being uh, directly encrypted. Um, but that gives you an idea of uh, you know, just how noisy the ransomware was. So we still have that process suspended, and we can go ahead and click uh, Terminate. And as we'll see here, the process is gone. Okay, so getting into, uh, you know, some more testing that I did at the framework, uh, I was able to text, uh, test against uh, nine samples that have, uh, were essentially holdouts because the ransom notes weren't part of our training or test data set. Uh, so we were able to uh, detect those nine specific samples uh, from those families, and as well as uh, three samples I tested uh, that already had notes in the training uh, set from earlier. So in order to get some, uh, you know, a better idea of how successful this approach is, I wanted to test against, uh, you know, what's currently out there. And so for our, for our cases, uh, for our case for this, we just wanted to do um, testing against anything that was free or trial-based. Um, you know, I didn't want to shot any money for uh, testing here. And we wanted to break it out for to two different tests. Uh, does, it protect, uh, does it detect the sample? And if it does, uh, can we run it side by side with the classifier framework we just came up with? And uh, we just want to give a rough estimate of what the detection speed looks like. Um, you know, there's, there's definitely potential complicating factors in that uh, for that particular test case because uh, things like driver altitude can, can definitely affect how the two uh, products are running side by side. Um, but, you know, just a way to get a rough idea of how the performance uh, you know, compares to actual uh, stuff that's currently available for download. And so uh, the testing actually went extremely well. Um, I kept things very generic. I don't want to call out any specific vendors or anything like that. Uh, but in our case, uh, there was one specific product that did perform uh, very well and was, was typically faster in detection uh, than the classifier framework uh, that I developed. And uh, 
That being said, the detections uh, where the uh, where product E did uh, per, uh, perform better, uh, the framework was was still close uh, in performance and you know lagged behind only by a couple of seconds or so. Um, but surprisingly, uh, there were two products that out, that were very uh, easily outperformed uh, by the classifier framework. And I mean, if you even look at the A1 and A2. Um, the uh, while it detects pretty much all of the time uh, for the 12 samples that we saw, uh, only uh, I think just unable to run a, a test for for one of the samples, but uh, it was outperformed nearly all the time by our framework, and that's actually pretty amazing considering uh, you know the, you know sort of uh, you know ad hoc approach that we took with uh, you know sifting through event logs for data. Um, and then doing all you know all this classification uh, at runtime, and you know doing it all in Python. We're you know uh, essentially going head to head with something that's running uh, native code, and probably leveraging a mini filter driver to obtain that, uh, their input. So definitely uh, validates the approach that we took. So that being said, you know those results are great, but there are definitely limitations with this approach. There are plenty of uh, ransomware samples that don't drop uh, .txt ransom notes. Uh, some don't even drop notes at all. Um, some try to convey their ransom message uh, just in a custom file extension that they apply to every single uh, file. Um, some samples drop ransom notes much later in the game uh, after all the files have been encrypted. Uh, and then there's also samples that uh, leverage some sort of persistence and, and typically respond even if you suspend the process, terminate it, whatever. Uh, yeah, we might be able to detect it, but it's going to just keep going over and over and over. Um, and of course, there are all, uh, ransomware uh, that actually take different approaches to um, uh, denying users access to their data, uh, NBR modifications, anything for raw disk, uh, or just simple screen lockers. Um, and of course, as we mentioned going in, uh, we're sticking only things. So future work, uh, we'd like to uh, improve the data sets. You know, definitely more ransom notes, uh, less synthetic, uh, the synthetic data would be nice as well. Um, you know, as well as uh, new ransom notes as, as new ransomware families uh, you know, come up and they're made aware of. And we'd also like to build out a more representative benign text data set, uh, you know, more log files, more installer files, uh, things of that nature. Uh, if we could port our code base to a lower level language, uh, that would be great and lead to very significant performance improvements, and we'd be able to uh, improve our detection time as well. Um, you know, it'd be nice to support uh, other file types, uh, like for the, uh, the formatted text, as I mentioned before, uh, as well as uh, images and you know, giving OCR to extract text. Um, Hispanic language support would, would be nice as well, um, as well as uh, experimenting with the actual uh, approach to the classification problem. So to wrap things up, uh, clustering gave us a good idea of the data being suitable for classification, uh, and we saw that ransom nodes do share enough features uh, for a solution to be viable. Um, and you know, going into this, we we do realize this isn't going to catch all ransomware, but it could be a very integral piece of a layer detection approach with a you know, static uh, classifier as well. Um, so yeah, the proof of concept did work, but there are definitely many improvements to be made. All right, thank you very much.